So good morning, everyone. Yes, indeed. Today we're going to be talking about creating an archaeo gaming scene. And first, um, we just want to introduce ourselves. So, um, so I'm Sarah. I'm an illustrator and art historian, um, and I did all the illustrations for the zine. Uh, I'm Florence. I'm an archaeologist. I work for Museum of London Archaeology. Um, but in my spare time, I do archaeo gaming. So that leads on to the obvious question: If you don't know what is archaeo gaming? Well, simply put, archaeo gaming is the archaeological study of video games. But they're kind of Lots of different ways you can do this. You can do this through studying representation of archaeology in video games, um, through viewing games as kind of archaeological sites, or even um, studying the code itself. Um, and those are just a few examples. Um, and on screen, I've also decided to include a few GIFs that, shows, that show kind of a range of many different kinds of games, including everything from a game that's literally 10 seconds long um, to kind of a big kind of blockbuster, triple A role playing game. Um, and given the kind of interactive nature of games, the fact that they're both very visual and can be text-based, it seemed to me that kind of communicating ideas about archaeo gaming through just purely text or um, kind of a written form is kind of actually quite inappropriate and limited. Um, and that's kind of really what led us to look at zines. So what is a zine? Um, a zine is a self-published kind of small circulation <coughs> and not-for-profit publication. Um, and just to kind of give a quick kind of history of zines, um, arguably um, you could say that they kind of had, had their beginnings in something like the 17th century with kind of religious or political pamphlets, but that's kind of looking at it from admittedly quite a Western perspective. Um, and often people trace the beginning of zines back to um, kind of the early 20th century with things like um, kind of pulp sci-fi and that's when kind of people started really to create their own sort of little um, publications about things that they were interested in. Um, and then kind of given the DIY nature of zines, um, not surprisingly, that's why they're very strongly associated, associated with the 70s punk movement, but also with the 90s riot girl movement, um, which was kind of this cultural phenomenon which was really focused on um, kind of young women um, kind of challenging stereotypes um, about gender and other things. Um, but I think it's kind of really important to remember that even though zines have this very kind of like countercultural sort of reputation, um, as has been pointed out by, um, for example, Addie Schrodes in uh, their thesis about um, kind of right girl movement and zines, um, often sort of um, women of colour were left out of the picture, um, whether at the time um, where they weren't, their kind of, their work and creativity wasn't acknowledged, or now with the scholarship that looks at kind of the right girl movement, um, the same thing happens. So I kind of just wanted to highlight that to kind of emphasise the point that just because they have that kind of association, we've also got to look into that and sometimes challenge it a bit. Um, and so I also wanted to give an example from the zine itself of kind of an archaeo gaming concept that we were interested in that we kind of wanted to show through both image and text and um, this is the assemblage at play. It's a concept put forward by T.L. Taylor in their 2009 article of the same name and basically the idea is that you can't understand gameplay by just looking at kind of the game itself. You've got to look at the player the actual hardware, so like the console and the gameplay, um, as well as lots of other factors as well. So, for example, kind of in this um, drawing, we're showing that you could have lots of different people in different places playing the same game, but they're bringing their own personal experiences to that assemblage. Um, so, whether that be um, their gender, uh, their race, their sexuality, their age or disability, or many other different things. Um, and so I think this is just a really great example of one of the illustrations that Sarah did. And so now we're going to move on to her discussing her creative process. Cool. Right. So while I'm rambling, this is basically the Pinterest board that I had while I was creating it. So this is sort of like a visual representation of what the inside of my brain has looked like. <coughs> if you want to appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so confession time. I'm more of a comic book geek than I am a gaming geek. Um, and I'm actually, I don't have a history in archaeology, my history is more in Japanese art history. So when Floss first came to me with the idea of working together on this scene, the first thing I thought of, was like, which really inspired me through the process, was actually a particular part of Japanese history. 
So in the Edo period, you start getting this focus on recording the history of like everyday lives, so just the normal things people do in their lives. And a big part of that was scrapbooking. Um, especially in the context of the celebrity culture and fandom surrounding um, Kabuki theatre. Um, so Kabuki theatre, quite like gaming today, I guess, um, was a big part of people's lives of popular culture entertainment, um, but it was also kind of looked down on a bit. People thought it was a bit frivolous. Um, and it, the, the way that the culture around it was created was very temporary. So you'd get um, playbills and posters, but they weren't really expected to last more than a couple of days or a few weeks at most. And, that meant you got a lot of anxiety in the communities that their, um, the things they were passionate about would get lost and would get forgotten. So creating scrapbooks um, in those communities was a way of fending that off, of creating an archive. And for me, that was what we were doing with this zine. Um, so you know, when you have um, a collection of, of things in a scrapbook, it means that you make them last longer and you give them more significance. Um, and I think gaming, it's transient in the sense that um, you get all these developments in the technology, you get new consoles, new games coming out, old games go out of mainstream circulation, it's easy to feel like things will get lost. Um, and even though people will sometimes talk about gaming like it's trivial, um, like it's not really an intellectual thing, it affects so many of us. I think what we wanted to show was that it's something that's worth documenting um, and studying and debating. It's something that affects all of us or a lot of us, um, if we have access to gaming. Um, and it's something that's worth talking about. Um, so I'm just going to go on. So this was kind of like just showing the process of, of how we were making, making the zine. Um, it, just to say as well, it was important to us that it was collaborative. Again, I was kind of inspired by the, um, the scrapbooking in that case. They would often um, have spaces left in the scrapbooks. People would pass them around their social groups. If someone had a playbill that no one else had, they could add it in and everyone sort of work together as a little like scrapbooking gang. So I think for us, the fact that we were collaborating was quite a big part of the project. And we've always said <coughs> if we did another issue, we'd quite like to get a lot more people involved, get a lot more different perspectives. Um, but it was, it was just us this time. And we started off with this really messy notebook page over here, um, where we had a brilliant idea for the front cover, which didn't work because it never does when you do your first idea. Um, and then it developed all the way over to this is the front cover. Um, but you can see right from the beginning, we had a list of names of um, female characters um, from games. And that was important to us because you quite often get, um, you get women in games, but they're not in the center of things. So like Legend of Zelda, you'd think would be mostly about Zelda. You know, she's in the title, but no, it's all about Link instead. And we thought, you know, it'd be nice if Zelda got a chance to be on the front cover and along with uh, like all the other female characters from some famous games. So that was sort of the idea behind the cover. Um, right, um, so this is just another example of what we were doing. So we had a concept that we knew we wanted to talk about, perma, perma death and perma life. And we were trying to find ways to show that in a simple illustration because of course that's a topic you could write like a whole thesis on, but we needed to show it in like two little pictures. Um, and we eventually came up with the idea of kind of like showing the game over screen for like, you know, death being permanent or the character being sort of brought back to life, getting a new life in the game. Um, and just some of the character designs we were doing there. Okay. Uh, we did have a few stumbling blocks along the way. So we had an idea for a page talking about like where Archeo Games should go next. And the idea was that we'd have um, a landscape showing someone journeying and then there'd be spaces for people to fill in where they wanted to go. And at first we were like, yeah, you know, we're going to do a, a standard fantasy landscape. Um, but it didn't really work in the end, firstly, because it kind of didn't make the right shapes. You know, it's part of the artistic process. You draw things, they look bad, you draw other things. Um, but also, it kind of like, the whole thing with like the mountain, we were like, it's kind of that fantasy trope, you know, where you, you, you travel along, but you're eventually going to the mountain, and then the big dramatic moment happens at the mountain. And we were like, is that not really how archaeo gaming should work? There shouldn't be one place we're heading for. People should feel like they're free to explore whatever areas they think are important because it's such a new area of study. Um, so in the end, we came up with the idea of space. You can go in any direction and, and explore whatever you want. Um, so these are just some of our ideas about the areas, you know, directions we think archaeo gaming could go in. And 
the idea is that you fill in on the other planets and things where you think it could go. Um, and we wanted it to be a bit interactive, so it's a colouring book page as well, you can <laughs> fill it out yourself. Um, and, you know, because that's the whole point. Games themselves are interactive, and it just seemed strange to have something about archaeo gaming that wasn't interactive. So we wanted people to be able to really engage with it. Um, right, and then, yeah, just so that's the, the final illustration. And for me, this page particularly was about using art as a language. So Floss's text is on the, the right hand side of the double page spread, um, and then the image is on the left. And the idea is that because um, people people learn in different ways. Like essays are great. Essays do things that other things can't really, really well. Um, but not everyone learns in the same way. So we were kind of thinking of like having you know something written in the English language and then something written in the language of illustration. So that however you think, you can look at the art page or you can look at the text page and still hopefully get the same idea. That was that was the idea. So I'll pass back over to Cross now. Yeah. So kind of just the finishing thought for this was. Um, Okay, so the question might be, how is this queer? Well, I think that um, our zine is kind of interesting in a way that we try to make it actually very accessible, rather than being this kind of very niche, potentially kind of cliquey archaeo gaming thing. Um, but as also a form of public archaeo gaming, there's kind of that tension between something that's personal but also public. Um, and also it is kind of in of itself sort of an artefact of our ideas at one time, but also an archive of lots of different kind of perspectives. Um, for example, we've even got some kind of QR codes in there, which are links to different kind of um, pieces and games um, about queerness and gaming. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. Um, please do come and talk to us um, if you want to get a copy of the zine. We were only able to have a limited <laughs> run, but um, we'd um, also love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, and you can fill out a coloring page if you want. Yeah. <laughs> and also, um, we will be uploading <coughs> a digital copy online as well um, on Sarah's Tumblr and on my website as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.